Thank you, Sudarshan. Thank you. Coming to our school and to be part of our open HSEs. We normally do this on Wednesdays, and because none of us has teaching. So, right. Otherwise, on all our days, there's always a class or something. So, it's a very pleased to have you here with us. Um, you know, I have to say that um, uh, he's a student of a rather famous uh, political scientist, Samuel Huntington. And uh, so he, you know, he got well known after fashion civilizations. Um, I think, you know, we have to say in fairness to him, he is still out. I mean, we think of cumulatively you know, a number of events, the ISS, ES, ISS, and so on. Uh, there's something there. Um, so you can tell us a little bit later uh, what kind of a man he is. Oh, yeah, no, I work closely with him. Yeah. You wrote another book called Who Are We? Brilliant. Uh, Although yes. offensive to a large number of people, yes. but absolutely yes. brilliant. Very, very powerfully argued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for who are we? Uh, for who are we? Who are we? Who are we? Americans. Um, so um, we have become this worked for long years in the in the World Bank and uh, uh, now uh, out of uh, the bank's harness. Uh, <laughs> so uh, and he's uh, offered to talk to us about uh, the future of the right to information in India. Um, who, who did we want in particular? Raj? Uh, do you think he got the invitation? We call Rajdeep. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's specialized in. Uh, oh, wonderful. He's not in our yeah. school. It'd be lovely to have him. He's yeah. in the School of International Affairs. But yeah. It'd be great. Wonderful. Available and on this topic, uh, he's, he did a, uh, a thing on how journalists use the right to information. Right, 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 right. Particularly journalists in the vernacular. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's sure. that's very very important. Yeah. So, okay, over to you, Vikram. Uh, Thank you, uh, uh, Sudarshan. Can Thanks. You turn on the, the this one. This is the mic. The the, the, the this thing there. Uh, the mic. Yeah, yeah, this one. This this. Uh, this no, 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 it's not there. It's not there. Not there. Uh, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, do yeah. I need that? Uh, I mean, wait, it's really no, quite a small. See, the uh, thing is, it's yeah. being recorded. Okay. Here, the mic on is called. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, are we all set up. Okay, great, wonderful. So, uh, so Darshan, how long? How, how long do I have uh, roughly? Um, uh, we generally have the session till about half past three, but um, you know, it's, uh, we'd like some time to. Yeah. No, no. I, I certainly don't plan to speak for an hour and a half. That would be uh, catastrophic. Uh, <laughs> imposition on all of you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I certainly won't do that. Uh, I'll try to wrap it up in about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, if you have a question in between, just jump in. Uh, because I can see this is more like a class, uh, classroom interactive kind of session. So just jump in whenever you like. Um, you know, I've been working on the right to information for a long time, actually, because we had a program um, at the bank which I uh, created, and it was a program to promote the right to information uh, across the region, and, uh, you know, and in India, of course, but across the region. And uh, it began actually quite innocuously in Karnataka many years ago when uh, we were negotiating the development policy loan uh, the, what in those days in sort of more, um, uh, you know, bald language uh, called the structural adjustment loan. And uh, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar was the uh, Minister of Information, and Krishna was the Chief Minister. B K Chandrasekhar, and uh, they were, had a draft right to information bill because in those days the uh, there was no central bill, and uh, uh, so the states were, were sort of adopting RTI, and it was a rather good draft. So we quickly incorporated it uh, into our structural adjustment loan, our DPL. Uh, development policy loan, as these things are now called, in bank parlance. And um, it became one of the uh, upfront reform actions. Um, and uh, so that was the beginning of our RTI program. And we, we, we kept hammering at this issue in different uh, you know, contexts, in the context of our projects, contexts of uh, 
you know, these, these uh, adjustment loans that, that we had in Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Karnataka in those days, and then UP, Bihar, uh, Orissa. And, uh, and then we took it uh, regional, we went regional, and we worked in Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and other places. So a, a lot, my, I thought I'd just explain to you why I picked this topic, because it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that uh, I've been working on, you know, uh, uh, a little bit on the sidelines, but ne nonetheless very engaged uh, as, as, as a funder and, a, and, and, and making programmatic choices on, on, on this area. So uh, with that, let me, let me begin. Of course, this is a, a kind of uh, topic that everybody has a view on. And uh, some people have very strong views. Um, well, that's what I'm here. Ah, sw swagato, yes. Oh, please, please have a seat. Uh, so uh, I feel lonely over here. So uh, <laughs> you're welcome to, to come up to the front. But uh, uh, as I was going to say, uh, let, me, let me begin, since um, Jindal has quite a puts quite a lot of emphasis on, on human rights. Uh, you know, RTI was always thought of as a right. And uh, that's not actually global practice. I mean, uh, you know, most acts up to about, uh, you know, the, the US Act in the late 60s, uh, uh, the Canadian and Australian Acts in the 80s, uh, refer to freedom of information. We also had an act called human rights. That's right, we did. That was the initial uh, uh, title of the act. And, uh, 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 but I think at some point, um, the Supreme Court, and I think this was in the 70s, deduced a right to information uh, from the right to expression. So you can't have freedom of expression without freedom of information because what you would express would not be particularly meaningful um, if you didn't have uh, information. I'm not sure about that reasoning because I think you're free to express yourself even if what you say is, is silly. But, uh, but nonetheless, that was the, the logic. And uh, I think activists liked this because it was linked to citizenship, entitlements, and uh, it conveyed the impression that, that uh, you know, information was not a favor that you could uh, uh, pry from a reluctant bureaucrat, but a right. And I remember having a conversation in Bangalore, actually, with the Secretary of Personnel, a very revealing comment. And although we're being recorded, I assume that this recording will just disappear into the black hole of... Uh, of, of your archival uh, uh, system. So uh, I was with Vatsala Watsa. Yeah, I mentioned her name. Wonderful person. She was the secretary. And she, I, I said, look, you know, you've got to put forward on the right to information. And she said, yes, you know, but it's our information. Why should we give it to others? And, and there was that very interesting aha that went off in my mind, which was, in fact, what she's suggesting is that government owns that information. It's not the people's information, it's government's information. And why should we therefore uh, 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 give it out? That's a really, just utterly revealing comment. And uh, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, I still think of that, that comment when I was a sort of relative greenhorn uh, 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 dialoguing with, with, with her. So many countries have made it a constitutional right, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Nepal, uh, uh, South Africa, this kind of thing. But this, this is sort of the later generation of right to information uh, acts. So that's the context. Now, um, you know, I don't want to get into a long discussion of the origins of RTI because we already have a good sense and I, I really want to focus on the future. But on the other hand, I think it is necessary to just highlight a few points. One is this intimate connection between RTI and environmental protection. A lot of concern about what happened in the Union Carbide scandal, you know, and the, uh, the, 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 the Bhopal gas tragedy and the lack of information provided by Union Carbide or the government on their environmental uh, safeguard plans, uh, utter disaster. Uh, uh, and I think that, that gave a fillip to, to transparency as, as sort of one of the positive aspects. The Bofors scandal as well. I mean, I think during the Bofors scandal, this is the first time that VP Singh raises the issue of, of transparency legislation. And, uh, you know, and then of course, we know the story of the MKSS uh, led by Aruna Roy and uh, the, uh, the, past, you know, the, the attempt to clean up muster rolls, the public hearing movement. I won't go into all that. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. If not, stop me and I'll say a little more about it. 
Um, and then you had a rash of state laws that spread across the country. Oddly enough, it was Karunanidhi who passed the first state law in Tamil Nadu in 1997. It was a law that had, I think, you know, I might be wrong, and I, I fear this recording because you catch all my errors subsequently. Someone will go and say, oh, he said this, he said that. 27 exceptions. And uh, so, but, but there was a right to information in Tamil Nadu. And, uh, no, it's all right, it's fine, I'm relaxed. Um, yeah. No, no, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. So, so, um, so there was this rash of laws, and uh, you know, Karnataka, Goa, uh, 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 Maharashtra passed a pretty good law under the influence of Anna Hazare. Uh, and then the Supreme Court basically ordered the government, at some stage, to enact an RTI law because Jake Malani, when he was Minister of Urban Affairs, released all his files. Yes. And, you know, there was a hullabaloo, and the government said, how can you do this? And, uh, you know, and so the files had to be uh, unreleased, and it was very, very embarrassing for the government. And at this point, the Supreme Court got wind of this and uh, asked the government to enact an RTI law. Of course, the BJP, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, adopted a weak law in 2002, a Freedom of Information Act, not an RTI Act, but it was never implemented. And then with the NAC, with people like uh, N.C. Saxena and uh, Aruna Roy on, on it, and Jairam Ramesh, um, Jean Drez, they got it through. And it was a fantastic uh, act, I mean, in terms of the uh, provisions. Of course, the bureaucracy doesn't like it. They, they find it uh, very encumbering. But that's the broad, very broad brush story of RTI. It's not, uh, believe me, there's a lot more to this uh, than what I've said. Now, um, let's, let me just give you a sense of the uh, dimensions of this, because it is a big deal. RTI is a big deal. Um, now, and I, I'll get into more analytic stuff later, but I just want to get the facts on the table. Um, there are, you know, between 2005, 2017, my good friend Venkatesh Nayak spends his days, and I spent some time with him before I prepared the talk. I went over to CHRI, I spent two hours with Sanjay Hazarika and, and, uh, and Venkat, especially Venkat, called out all these numbers, and so these are accurate numbers. He, you know, 21.4 20, million RTI requests have been filed in India between 2005, 2017. That, I mean, proportionally that may not seem like a lot, but in absolute terms, it is gigantic. Remember, the total pendency of, this, of, the, of the judicial system is 30 million. So you have 21.6 for million requests. This is through 16, 17. We don't have the, I, I, Venkat didn't have the numbers for 18 and 19, so I couldn't, I couldn't get them from him. And, and you see these applications rising, especially in the larger states and at the central level. But, you know, there are commissions that have not published their annual reports on the website. And Venkat's data, this is all Venkat's data, Venkat's data depends on whether an annual report has been, has been put up on the web. If it's not put up on the web, how can you extract the figures? So that this, this is actually an understatement, yes. you know. Now, um, just for your knowledge, uh, there are 500,000, half a million public information officers around the country. Think, and they're the cutting edge of the act. Think of them as nurses, think of them as doctors, think of them as teachers. They are the deliverers of RTI under the act. If you think of it as a delivery system, they're the ones who administer the act. And 23,000 first appellate authorities, these are internal appellate authorities, usually the HOD, uh, sometimes the additional secretary. Um, you know, so that's RTI figures globally. And you, know, you can see here uh, that in 2005, 2006, you have uh, about 24,000 application requests to the Information Commission, central government. Uh, and central government gets about 24,000 requests for information. At the end, you're close to a million uh, requests. Now, you know, you can just see this, this surge in requests, which I think is, is, you know, graphically displayed there. Okay. Now, Shekhar Singh and others have done a series of surveys. This is the National Campaign for the People's Right to Information, a series of surveys uh, in 2008, 2013, and I commissioned some work with them uh, on uh, analysis of applications data. When I was at the World Bank, we went through 4,000 
uh, applications, RTI requests, so we could sort of cull out the patterns. I'll just go through this so that you have a sense of uh, some of the findings. I, I hope I don't bore you. If so, please stop me because the greatest crime is to bore people in a, in a, in a presentation, so I don't want to be guilty of that crime. Now, 75% of the people feel that access to government information would be helpful in 13, and that's a 10% increase over five years relative to 2008. 60% uh, of the urban sample had heard of RTI in 13, up from 45% in 8. And uh, there was also some evidence of, 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 of a high degree of awareness in rural areas as well, based on rural group discussions. Uh, 67% of men and 54% of women in state capitals were aware of the act. And 82% of those who had heard of the RTI Act felt that it was relevant to them. So clearly, people were aware of it. They felt it was relevant. And, uh, you know, uh, and they felt it would be helpful to them in their daily lives. So clearly, this was a valued initiative. Now, how is RTI used? Now, this is a study that... Uh, that the bank commissioned uh, with RAG and TAG. TAG is a group that, we, that the bank set up, the Transparency Advisory Group, that consists of information commissioners and uh, uh, you know, secretaries to government, parliamentarians across the region. Um, and we produced lots of uh, analytical work around that. Now, we found that 67% of all RTI applications sought information that should have been provided proactively under the proactive disclosure provisions of the Act. So the question then becomes is why are you forcing people to go through uh, a request process? Right? I mean, this should have been provided uh, proactively. And, uh, you know, Manmohan Singh, and I'll get to Manmohan Singh later, made the claim that uh, a lot of vexatious requests were being filed. But as we classified the requests and looked at them, we found that only 1% of RTI applications were found to be vexatious or frivolous. Of course, you could say that, well, but this was an activist group that did this classification, and perhaps, you know, the criteria for classifying something as vexatious was, uh, you know, was uh, too stringent, and, and et cetera, et cetera. You could quarrel with this data, is what I'm saying. Very worrying. These are 4,000 applications that we sampled across the country. 6% of applications were filed by women. 6%. That means that you have a massive gender bias. Massive overwhelming gender bias in the use of the RTI Act. They're all guys filing requests, no women. And that, to me, is very, very concerning. It's also suggestive, and we need to actually do some research on this to figure out why this is happening. Then, you know, to the point that, oh, these are just civil servants litigating for their own, you know, pension benefits uh, or their own, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever, ser service issues, only 4% of the applications were filed by civil servants. So that's also debunked. Now, this is kind of interesting, although you, you might, it, it is a bit opaque as well. Oh, shucks. Yeah. Um, where's the pointer, uh, 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 Sunita? Uh, this thing up here? Is this a pointer? Yeah, anyway, what you see here is, is quite uh, interesting because um, you see norms a lot of requests around norms this refers to regulations rules norms of service delivery then you see delays presumably in services then you see questions uh, you see 57 percent of your applications relate to decisions what decision was taken in this case you know dates of decisions was any action taken um, schemes, benefits, concessions. So a whole lot of things are, are popping up relating to service delivery. You know, why wasn't a service delivered on time? How can I get access to a ration card? What's the process? Uh, you know, where is the ration shop located? I mean, a whole lot of stuff. Uh, uh, how can I file an FIR? A whole lot of stuff is just linked to service delivery. So the act was not just being used to get information, it's being used to get information about service delivery processes. Norms uh, in the study is defined as rules, processes, regulations, and standards. So that's how they defined it. So, uh, you know, the norms of delivering a service. Um, and then uh, financial public resources, about 
And then a lot of stuff just about the, the, the decision making process. 41% what action was taken. So there was one case of a woman who'd been allotted a DDA flat 30 years ago, but actually never got a possession certificate and she kept writing and writing and writing and uh, you know, you know, why has action, no action been taken? So th things like this. So what you see is the RTI Act is being used, and this is the important point, for grievance redress and to pry open information about opaque service delivery processes. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's not really, uh, in most countries, it's just give me this piece of documentation. Here it's because there aren't uh, other avenues to pressure the government uh, on services or to improve the transparency of, of, of decision making. So let's move away from this. Now, I think I've given you a good sense of the, the ground. Now let's get to, into the sort of more interesting parts of the talk. But I did want to just, I did want to give you a sense of the lay of the land. The RTI faces huge challenges today in, in the current environment. It's a 50-50 gamble about whether it'll survive in its current form. Now, uh, shifts in the authorizing environment. Um, and this is not just Modi. This also goes to Manmohan Singh. I mean, you know, the politicians, once they realized what they'd unleashed, wanted to sort of put the genie back into the bottle. And there was lots of attempts to amend the RTI Act. Then there were technical difficulties. It's a little bit like the GST. You pass an ambitious GST, you can't really implement it effectively. It's flawed in design. So, you know, there are all kinds of technical issues, records management, poor training of these 500,000 PIOs, and proactive disclosure, just problems. Gridlock in information commissions. And then this whole emergence of a, of a privacy movement stoked by the Aadhaar uh, question, um, where, where I think the government really overreached, uh, although I'm not an opponent of Aadhaar, but I do, I think it's a useful initiative, but I think they really overreached, went too fast, and as a result got derailed. Uh, and then, uh, troublingly, and again, I don't want to blame this government only, this is a general, you know, our accountability institutions are in bad shape. And you can't rely just on RTI. If the whole structure is collapsing, um, you know, or near collapse, you know, you can't expect one element to prop up the, the, the whole rickety uh, structure. So let's go into changes of, in the authorizing environment. Now, this is Tony Blair speaking after uh, he pushed Parliament to adopt the UK's Freedom of Information Act in, uh, I think, 2004. And, uh, you know, it's really quite amusing, you know, freedom of information, the three harmless words. I look at these words as I write them and feel like shaking my head till it drops off my shoulders. You idiot, you naive, foolish, irresponsible, in income poop. There is really no description of stupidity, no matter how vivid that is adequate. I quake at the imbecility of it. Uh, and then, once I, once I appreciated the full enormity of the blunder, I used to say more than a little unfairly to any civil servant who would listen, where was Sir Humphrey when I needed him? We had legislated in the first throes of power. How could you, knowing what you know, have allowed us to do such a thing so utterly undermining of sensible government? Where have you seen it in biography? It's in his biography. This is after the, after, you know, he was a big supporter of the freedom of information and then of course it began to hit him in the face. And, uh, you know, and this is his response. Now our own Manmohan Singh, whom I do respect quite a lot and uh, like, uh, was much milder. But he's making the same point, right? We need to balance the need for information with the limited time, material, and human resources available with public authorities. Vexatious demands should not be allowed to deprive genuine information seekers of their legitimate claims on limited public resources. Very mild. Uh, we must also realize that laws over a period of time adopt themselves to a change to changing realities as societal perceptions change, fine, blah, blah, blah. And most importantly, right to information is not a substitute for good governance. It has to support and aid the process of good governance. And that actually is a key point to which I will return at the end of the talk. What does all this add up to in terms of, you know, a change in governance? Have we really experienced a change of governance because of this? Or is this just a lot of uh, hoopla and hullabaloo uh, 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 about nothing. So, with our two mentors behind us, Tony Blair and Manmohan Singh, let me now get into the, the first threat to the act. The first threat pops up quite fast. Um, you know, it pops up, uh, you know, around the time of the passage of the RTI Act. 
and it's really very funny. Uh, the DOPT, without consulting anyone, puts up guidance on its website saying file notings are exempt under the RTI Act. You guys know what a file noting is. Who knows what a, who can describe what a file noting is? Can you describe? Can you describe what a file noting is? Me? Yes, you. No, not Rajiv, the gentleman next to you. Rajiv will know in and out. Tell us. Yes, like is it like a noting on a uh, official file that sometimes like a comment or something? Yes, R Rajiv, would you care to? Uh, yeah, I just add a line. It's a decision making process, which is done on a stipulated kind of a sheet, a green part of a green sheet. It's a light green sheet. Brilliant. And finally, you take a decision and it goes to the whichever authority has the mandate to, whichever level has the mandate to uh, speak on that issue. So, this is where bureaucrats ha have to apply their mind on the file. And if I can see a file noting, and let's say a minister said, you know, authorize this procurement, and the bureaucrat, he tells me that verbally, and I as a bureaucrat write authorize that procurement and give, give reasons that can then be questioned subsequently. And so bureaucrats are terrified of what they write on the file um, increasingly. And so the argument was, well, this would prevent bureaucrats from applying their mind. Now, uh, the CIC jumped in and said, no, 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 these file notings have to be in the public domain. The DOPT for months refused to take down this bit of guidance. DOPT, by the way, is the Department of Personnel and Trading. They are the owners of the RTI Act. They are charged with implementing the RTI Act within government, right? They're the custodians of RTI. And uh, usually what you'll see is a joint secretary with a deputy secretary, an undersecretary, and a section officer, but they have immense power. So finally, with a lot of hullabaloo, they took it down. And now people, say, people accept the fact that file notings are part of RTI. So that's the first attempt to dilute the RTI. The second was this whole fiasco that's still going on about political parties. Are political parties part of the act? Are they not? And uh, you know, uh, 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 the Association for Democratic Reforms took a case to the CIC. The CIC said, yes, they're part of, uh, uh, of the uh, RTI. Now, of course, I don't know what you all think of that. Swagatosh, do you think that uh, political parties should be part of the RTI? No. Why? Okay. Anyone disagree with that? You, yeah? If there were public funding in top elections, yeah. on, then there was a okay. point. Fair enough. You, you want to add to that? Not really. I mean, as things stand now, the, there's a very good reason for exempting political parties from the RTI. But, I mean, if things were to change, if the definition of a political party were to be set, Right, in very formal terms, then they would fall under the ambit of RTI because then they would also be uh, held liable for all the transgressions that happen during election processes. Right? So, the Election Commission of India in, um, and also the Raw Commission, they recommended that the political party be included within the ambit uh, of the, the representation of People's Act. Right? So, if that were to happen, then uh, we could very well hold political yeah. parties to. And you know what? You, you're both right. Some countries include political parties under the RTI, and some countries don't. Some countries make the argument that you're making, Swagatha, which is that, well, these are you know, ordinary citizens uh, you know, uh, forming a political party. Others make the case. It's a bit of a legacy problem here, because the Constitution of India yeah. didn't mention political parties. Right. The mention of political parties comes under the uh, schedule which deals with disqualification for en masse defection. Yeah, defection. Schedule 10. So, Till then, the assumption is that any individual can set themselves up to represent the people mm -hmm. and offer themselves right. to elections. So political parties as an entity, as a constitutive element of the state, was not 
part of the framework of the Constitution. Mm. So in that sense, the argument is that there's always a part of civil society, an ally in the state. So uh, whereas the modern, I mean, the data understanding is that parliamentary democracy, the sine qua non of a parliamentary democracy. Precisely. Are the political parties. That is right. That is right. So and that's exactly the argument that the, the Central Information Commission made. You cannot divorce representation in parliament from political parties. Uh, and the very government emerges from political parties. So they are clearly playing a public function. Plus the point about uh, public financing, they do get subsidized advertising. And uh, you know, uh, 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 they do get uh, other forms of, of, of support, uh, including uh, media access and other kinds of things. Yeah. So it's Do not... support this uh, offices that they are handed over in the Sufi and Delhi? You know, each of the political parties. Yes, and, 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 and it yeah. just goes on for, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... It depends on the this number of public funding. funding. Okay. This is public funding. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that depends on the number of seats that you get. And what yeah, yeah. Point. But yeah. how much work you have? No, many of them who have lost the number of seats. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, the, so the case just went back and forth, and eventually um, this went up to the Supreme Court, and it's still being heard by the Supreme Court. But government actually quickly introduced a draft amendment saying parties are excluded, clarificatory amendment. But that died. It, it, it never went anywhere because there was again huge protests. This is all pre-BJP, so you can't hammer Modi on this. You have to hammer, you know, the DOPT, you have to hammer actually Supreme BJP Court and Congress. The Supreme Court exempted itself. That's right. <laughs> they said, look, we don't, we're not part of RTI. Don't ask us about our assets and liabilities. Don't ask us about our appointment procedures. I mean, this, but, you know, the, people are reluctant to criticize the Supreme Court, especially RTI activists, because, you know, if you have a juggernaut like the court against you, you're, you're sunk. And the court has come up with some pretty good rulings for the RTI although they've consistently made the point that they're not part of RTI, even though it's clear that they are part of RTI. They ought to be. They, and they ought to be part of RTI. That's a battle that hasn't been fought yet fully, fully. And I think it's also tied up with things like the Collegium and the National Judicial Accountability Bill, which sort of collapsed, uh, and, and, and this whole question of uh, you know, judicial appointments. You know, we'll have to sort that out in a, in a single package. So um, basically, uh, these were the pre-Modi amendments. Now, this government was very sly, uh, very, very sly. I, I must say, I must hand it to them. Because, uh, you know, the bureaucracy is so opaque and complicated. Silence is not complete, I suppose. <laughs> no, but, but maybe it was a bureaucrat the, who thought this one up. But basically, what they said was, you know, we, 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 we want to make a distinction between constitutional commissions and bodies and non-constitutional commissions. And the RTI is a non-constitutional commission. Therefore, we're going to regulate salaries and emoluments uh, 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 through rules and not through the act. Now, the odd thing is the RTI Act says that an information commissioner at the central level will have the same rank as an election commission, commissioner. Let me ask you, what is the rank of an election commissioner? No. No. You guys are public policy experts. What is the, what is the rank of an election commissioner? Supreme Court judge. Supreme Court judge. So your, your Vajat Habibullah, uh, Satyanand Mishra, Shailesh Gandhi, they all have the rank of Supreme Court judges. So basically, the idea was we will remove that from the act, and this will be regulated through the rules. And government can change the salaries and emoluments from time to time. Effectively, this See, is a yeah, civil servants say it's a subject to orders of government. Yeah, and, and basic which which is a devastating, you know, blow at their independence. And it's also the idea is also to, to sort of lower the you know, you guys, you know, you're not that important. Bring your prestige down a little bit. And now in the States, information commissioners have the rank of a chief secretary. Which is important because if you're going to tell the chief secretary, if you're going to tell government to release sensitive information, you have to ha at least be equivalent. Uh, in authority to the chief secretary. If you think of the world in bureaucratic ways, I, in hierarchical ways, I don't think of the world in hierarch hi hierarchical terms, but I'm not a bureaucrat. Um, but bureaucrats have hierarchy instilled into them you know, from the time they join the service. 
uh, you know, my old friend, uh, I won't mention his name, I can't do this with the recording on, but I was sitting in his house in Bhopal, and he gets a call, it's about seven in the evening, and it's a three minute call, and I counted the number of times he used the word sir, <laughs> 17 times. I think we should ban the word sir. You must have stood up also. I stood up, like, sir, 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 sir. And I just said, you know, what, what are you doing to our people? You know, we want independence, we want autonomy, we want some kind of confidence, you know, entrepreneurship. Get rid of this sir business. But anyway, this hierarchy, they, they basically wanted to undercut the, the commission. This again hasn't gone anywhere uh, and it's flopped. Uh, uh, and more perniciously, the act says you could be a commissioner till 65 or five years. This was going to be shifted to the rules giving government the power to regulate the tenure of commissioners. Now this is getting serious. It's not just about parties or you know, file notings. This is getting to the very heart of you know, controlling the people who administer the RTI Act, who oversee it. You know, you're crippling an autonomous institution. Now the challenge of proactive uh, disclosure. This is what, you know, what we call in our sort of, you know, colonial uh, sort of psych, psyche, we, we love to use Latin words, sumoto. And actually what it means, sumoto just means, you know, you, you've provided this information yourself. And, uh, but we, in most countries talk about proactive disclosure. It's not request-based disclosure. There are two kinds of disclosures. This is proactive. And, uh, you know, this is where we're doing poorly. I, I don't need to make the case for proactive disclosure. But it's up here. Basically, it reduces pressure on information commissioners because a lot of stuff can be just done proactively. Central Information Commission today has 23,000 cases pending and a million cases coming in a year. They're dying. They can't handle it. Some of these commissioners will, will, will basically collapse under the weight of their own files, die. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite funny, actually. So, I mean, the point is, what this shows is, on the one hand, it shows that Indians are interested in RTI, and the other hand, it shows a total flop of the machinery of proactive disclosure. We just aren't disclosing information proactively. People just have to ask questions. And, uh, you know, budgets, procurement schemes, critical. And especially, you know, we, we've done, uh, the IMF has done good research on this, and uh, I'll, I'll recommend some of these papers. How many of you are aware of the IMF's work on the impact of proactive disclosure on, uh, on investment flows. Okay, there's a good paper on this. And basically, it shows that you, you, your credit ratings improve, borrowing costs go down, and investor confidence goes up when you have access to lots of reliable fiscal information. And this is a big issue. I remember you know, when I was working on Mexico many years ago, uh, you know, the uh, Banco Central you know, fudged their FX foreign exchange figures, reserve figures. And there's a big hullabaloo and you know, money flowed out and a big uproar. So, uh, the IMF was not uh, uh, aware that this was happening because they are supposed to be looking at these figures. Right? They are the ones who are they're supposed to monitor. monitor. Yeah, of course, they raised it. They raised it. But the Mexican government was, was thinking of another constituency. And those are Mexicans who, who, who they didn't want capital flight. And the peso was under pressure. So they started to fudge their data or not re and, and release it in an untimely fashion because they didn't want to spark a panic. So there's all kinds of uh, things going on here. So, and open data. And, uh, you know, open data is, is pretty sophisticated because uh, you can release all kinds of data sets um, for the private sector to mine and use and reprocess. And this data development industry, it's, it's a huge industry. But for that, you need things like uh, machine readability, don't use PDF files, it, the data should be alterable, manipulable, um, and advanced search engines, geomapping, artificial intelligence. You can do a hell of a lot with this. But you know, we have a straitjacket. We have section 41, we have some fields, and bureaucrats just take off the fields, and they put the stuff up casually. Uh, I say everything that is not exempt should be out in the public domain, and you should be able to search it using sophisticated algorithms that can be developed. And we should spark a data uh, industry that relies on gov government data sets. But this is an ambitious goal. You know, it'll happen, but... Uh, and one problem in, in that happening is that a lot of these data sets which haven't released on the open government portals 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, they are very restricted, so there would be data which is available only in the direct banking trend of 2030. Yeah. Then there are large gaps, uh, gaps of 5 years, 10 years, data is fragmented. So, this kind of a data set is not really available to manipulation in the form of algorithm. No, that's the problem. So, we have to, somebody has to instruct these people, you know, that this is the way to do it. Now, shamefully, in 2008, uh, the, the 2018, the CIC commissioned a study by two former information commissioners, Tiwari and, um, and one other guy. And this is what they came up with. First of all, they sent out a, form, a, a, sample, a questionnaire to 2,000 plus public authorities from the commissioner, chief information commissioner, only 40% respond. Look at the cheek of that. You don't respond to a questionnaire from the chief information commissioner. 60% of you don't respond. What is this? utter sloppiness. Um, it, it, it's a red flag right there. You don't even need to go to the results. Now, I go to the results and only 19% receive an A rating. 35% receive a, uh, 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 an E, fail, and uh, the others are in between. And so 62% of the sample receive scores of less than B five years after the RTI Act. It's a disaster zone. You know, everybody just publishing their own stuff. There's no coordination. There's no attempt to sort of do the kinds of things I just mentioned. Uh, and we're all more confused than, than we were at the, at the beginning. Now, what ails poor proactive disclosure? Records management. You know, I, I remember in Bihar going to see the Secretary Panchayati Raj. And that was a boring discussion, utterly boring. And he was also not very smart and... Um, Frankly, uh, I, hope, I hope this tape is, is, is just disappears forever or get, the rain gets into your tape. So, but anyway, chat about rules. Uh, anyway, um, you know, uh, but what was really interesting about that meeting was not the meeting. It was climbing up the stairs to the meeting because under the stairs were files out in the open. Files and files and files property records, this record, that record, government files, all over the gallowed, you know, uh, papers all over the place. This is Indian bureaucracy in 2018. Wonderful, fabulous. Now, how can you, how can you expect to proactively retrieve information with these sorts of records? You can't. And so I took two or three pictures of it. I, unfortunately, I lost those pictures because I changed my phone. So I, I was going to put them up today, but then I thought, you know, why do I want to need, be so nasty? Um, so maintenance of information silos resulting in a jumble of data. Nobody's the wiser. And, you know, uh, Nandan Nilakani in the Special Technology Projects Committee, you will know about this, Raji, proposed the, this expenditure information network that was supposed to track spending right down to the village level. Uh, so now. Yeah. The, it's been you see, they've got this public financial management system run by accounts in the Ministry of Finance. It's pretty good. I think that's a big advance. Uh, but the thing, and, and you know, because it tracks DBT and it tracks centrally sponsored schemes and all that. The, the problem is, uh, you know, I can't get into that database uh, because it's, it's locked. Uh, uh, and so you it's not open to researchers to study uh, and cross-verify. So I would like them to open this whole database up. So that we can, all of you can just jump in and start an analyzing it, you know, and uh, that that's something you could raise with 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 with, with accounts in, in 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 the in the thing. We're doing pretty well on the OBI 48 in terms of the country score at the central level, but at the state level, where is the discussion of budgets? Where is the pre-consultation? Where are the documents? So what is OBI? Open Budget Index. Oh, yeah. So. Um, now, this is interesting. Several states make it easy to file RTI requests online, but no attempt has been made to put all RTI requests online, including the responses, so I can search those. Right? So let's say I ask Jindal a question. I ask you the question, is your, we were talking about this, Sudarshan and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, simple question. Um, uh, how much do you pay the Haryana government on property tax? That RTI query. Okay, if I've asked that question. Now, if somebody else wants to ask that question, they don't have to come back to Jindal or to the government. They can just say property tax, Jindal. Reply pops up from the government and the, and the first query. S similarly, I mean, you know, so we don't have to repeat, you know, reinvent the wheel. Now, this is England. Can I just stop you here for a yeah. to share an anecdote? Please, 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 please. Uh, way back in 2008, 
Yeah. Because for the duration of the session, parliament session, people did nothing but just answer. I know, I know. So I started an initiative to computerize the answers. I started that as planning commission. It's a good initiative. I also influenced the two secretaries, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, to do it. But they were pretty slow. So while I was on that scene, this is what used to happen every week prior to the day the question was supposed to be. Secretariat chap from Rajya Sabha or Lok Sabha would call me up. Sir, I'm reading questions. I'm reading. I hope everybody can understand. Yeah. He would say, "Yeah, but this ministry ko jana chahiye." He was a section officer, LCC kind of a person. And I used to give him my time because that actually reduced the number of questions coming to planning commission by almost 40 percent. So I would sit down. Yeah. I would say, "Yes, pucho." Then I would tell him on the and there are certain criteria yeah, yeah, yeah. which allow you to allocate the question. So I knew that, understood it, and I would tell him, that, don't send it to planning commission, that this question part A deals with RD, so send it to RD. And we devised an informal system which started streamlining. But the fact that this was started in planning commission, it eventually led to cutting down the question by 40%. No, that's a fantastic and example. And you need this kind of yeah, explorer-based yeah. system yeah. to weed Absolutely, out you do. Now, this is England. Get answers from the government and public sector. It's a platform. You can f file your RTI request. The RTI response comes back. It goes into the public domain along with your request, anonymized. And you can search all, you can search, you know, whatever. I mean, I think they've got 547,000 requests that you can search. And the responses to that. So, I mean, we're not such geniuses that we're, we're going to think of unique questions every time. Right? What, what's occurring to Sudarshan will probably also occur to me and also occur to Raji Boswagato. So, you know, and the Mexicans are the ones who actually started this. I won't say too much about this. Uh, you know, Plataforma Nacional de Transparencia. And uh, this was, you know, after democratization, one party state was kicked out and uh, you got, uh, you got uh, a democratic government. And so, you know, what, what we have here is todas las solicitudes de información y sus respuestas de 2003. Uh, and this is basically. Oh. Hi, hi, Rajiv. Hi, nice. Thanks for coming. So uh, basically, what you have are all the requests for information and all the responses on the platform, and I can just access it, play with it. If I want to ask, you know, what is the salary of a given official, I don't need to ask that of the government. I can just type that in, and the answer pops up. So you get the idea. No, 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 we don't know. No, so, no. so uh, many questions would be duplicated. Yes, we have yeah. to, they have to be weeded out mechanically, no? And they would do a Xerox, they give you a photocopy at this thing. There's no electronic version. I mean, it's silly. I mean, we should do this. But you see what happens? That filtration has to be done mechanically. Oh. So somebody, it takes that much more time. Even the questions are awesome, right? The answers are not on. No. So basically what you want is an open portal with all the requests, all the responses that is searchable. And that will cut the pressure down on these information commissions tremendously. You know, uh, and so from a... It's, it's, it's not rocket science, it should be done. It's just lack of... Lack of, I mean, you're kind. And put that on the web. And put it on the web. Yeah. That process it's, very, very, it's so simple. It's, it's such a simple thing to do. And countries have already done it. The UK, Mexico, other places. We have the experts here now who could tell us a little more about it. <laughs> yeah, you want to jump in? Uh? <laughs> yeah, he's used the RTI. Yeah. No, no, please jump in. You, uh, you want to say anything on this? Uh? No, no, I think it's after, at the end, you know, maybe after. 
All right, okay, good. Uh, on your file uh, thing, I can't resist. When I was working on Punjab, um, we did an analysis of all queries made by uh, the uh, Vidhan Sabha members of the government. And we found a lot of it related to transfers and postings, a lot of it related to procurement. Um, these were the two items, transfers, postings, and procurement. No, you said, uh, you know, just as anecdotally, I have to say, in defense of the government of India's file was covered in red tape. Yeah. There was a simple bit of information that was needed, which is who have been posted by the UNDP in India yeah. as the resident representative and the operations manager. From the time the UNDP was established in India in 1969, right? no one in the UN system in UNDP headquarters could pull that out. Could get that information. My God. In Five minutes, the Department of Economic Affairs pulled it out. Uh, Secretary of Economic Affairs said, We'll get you the information. Told some Babu, he brought the files, and there it is. Fantastic. You know, yeah. all so the information. It's a question of you know, the information. Yeah. Is there. yeah, it's there. It's there. But it's just that we have. No, also, no, it was also used in another way. The um, Rockefeller Foundation, um, which had left India, in 71, there was a stock market crash. And so they closed some offices. Unfortunately, at that time was the Bangladesh and the Nixon tilt. So the Rockefeller closure had to do with its finances, but it was 71. So they left. And they wanted to reopen the office. So we went along, and Ford Foundation was supporting the Rockefeller Foundation. We went to Secretary of Economic Affairs and said Rockefeller wants to reopen the office. So Secretary of Economic Affairs. I said, but uh, you know, when did we ever ask you to close your office? We <laughs> never asked you to close your office. We don't even know that you closed your office. <laughs> so how can you ask us to reopen your office? Now this bit of institutional memory was not there in the Rockefeller Foundation. It's there in the Department of Economic yeah. Affairs. Yeah, so as, as, as Rajiv says, all of this institutional memory is there somewhere. And it's up to us to use the latest technological means Sorry, to I collate that. Please, please, please. But that's zero derailing your talk. No, no, I don't mind. I'm, I'm relaxed. Go ahead, go ahead. Please, please, please. So, I, when I joined the US, I went to Geneva. One of the challenges I was facing was to figure out how much rental subsidy I will get. Right, 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 right. That will then allow me to pick up the kind of location I would put my family in and yeah, the yeah. size of the apartment. And nobody in the US would actually work out and tell me beforehand, before my first salary. Which is essential information. Very critical. Critical for you. Who is yeah. Doing it, yeah. How much rental subsidy I'll get, and so you could decide where you want. They couldn't give me. I had to wait not for my first uh, rental slip, but for the second one. I know. To work it out backwards to the. And, and face the stress and of dealing with that. Exactly. The stress. The same yeah. Thing I agree. In all I had to do was with all our problems and issues, I had to just call the dealing hand. Dealing hand is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep. Issues. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the LDC will tell you. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, there, there are advantages to the way we operate as well. So now on the information commissions, as far as pendency is con concerned, alarming pendency rates. And this data is from CHRI, DRAG, and they in turn have got it from the IC reports, the ones that have been published on the web, because not all IC reports have been published. Now, a lot of this reflects the obduracy of public information officers, or fear, perhaps, because they, they, they're worried they're going to be pulled up by a senior officer if they you know, release something sensitive, and so everything is classified as sensitive. Uh, just let cases go into appeal. And frankly, the first appellate authority rung has failed. Um, so you have more and more cases just going straight uh, to the commissions, and they're getting bogged down. And of course, if you, if, you, if, you know, if you take a sort of conspiratorial view of this, and you, you think that, well, you know, really government does, is not a friend of RTI, then obviously turn down all your requests, let it go up to the commissions, let the commissions uh, you know, collapse under their own weight, and destroy the entire firmament of, of RTI. Now, 25% of positions in information commissions are vacant. But you know, actually, that seems like a lot. But actually, if you compare it to health or education or police, it's roughly the same. You'll see similar rates, 20 to 30% vacancy in police, 
and in um, in, uh, in 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 frontline positions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, these are frontline positions. There are fewer information commissioners. There are about you know 153 information commissioners across the country. Um, you know, so the question would be, you know, there you can't. Why would you apply this 25% metric? I mean, you know, uh, it's not as if you have to hire 100,000 uh, police persons, uh, which would be a fiscal uh, issue. Uh, you know, if were you to do that to increase the, the size of the police force. Now, this also is interesting. 90% of the CICs. Uh, uh, retired civil servants, and 53% for the IAS. Little less pronounced, uh, you know, uh, dominance of the civil services at, at the state level. 43% are uh, 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 civil servants. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, because civil servants at least understand the government. So you know, it takes a, it, it takes a thief to catch a thief, a bureaucrat to catch a bureaucrat. So you know, they they can see through uh, uh, some of this. On the other hand, I mean, the argument has been made that, uh, that this is just a parking spot. I, I remember joking with Shekhar Singh the other day. I had lunch with him. Shekhar is this wonderful man. I don't know if you, any of you know him. But I said, you know, all you've done with these massive efforts to promote transparency is that you've created a wonderful parking spot for retired bureaucrats. Fabulous place. <coughs> Park them. They get, you know, now with the revised scales, uh, Supreme Court judge, uh, 2 lakhs, uh, 25,000 uh, base salary, dearness allowance. And uh, you know perhaps a flat and a, a car, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you know so, but you know that's a bit cynical. I frankly, I think I'm being too cynical. Um, commissions have failed to implement the penalty provisions. Why are they not implementing penalty provisions? Um, you know, and uh, you know, they, they, there was a calculation that uh, you know in, in terms of foregone revenue, that, that the foregone revenue of this is about. Uh, 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 300 uh, uh, billion rupees. Now I don't know if that. Uh, sorry, 3 billion rupees. Uh, 3 billion rupees is the uh, lost revenue. Now, you know these are figures put out by activists, so you have to take them with a pinch of salt. Uh, but these are activists I trust. People like Shaker, people like Venkat. I mean, these are these are solid activists in the RTI uh, space. So you know I can only quote this. And if you look at the cases, there are lots of cases where penalties could have been applied, they were not applied. So the logic is, if you, don't, if you don't penalize, they're not going to respond. On the other hand, if you penalize, you might get the whole bureaucracy up in arms against you, and you know, uh, then what happens? Several commissions haven't published their annual reports on time, and UP and MP have never published their annual report online, ever, ever. I mean, uh, so, what do you do with a government like this? Now, this is the pendency rate. I was having a little bit of trouble doing this uh, table, and the data for the Central Information Commission, I just couldn't get it on, to come onto the screen, onto my graph. But the Central Information Commission has a pendency of 23,000 cases at the moment. So this is annual or cumulative? This is uh, cumulative. This is cumulative. It's cumulative as of 18. So, you know, Central Information Commission is 20,000 plus. UP is 40,000 plus, Maharashtra 40,000 plus, these, these big states have problems and the CIC. Orisha is going up, Bihar is, uh, you know, undivided Bihar. They don't ask any questions about What? They've given up. They've given up, I think they've given up in Bihar, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. Because the highest in Kerala, where, where they've undertaken police reform, where you can actually register an FIR on the phone. So, it's crime invested and there's no crime. Yeah, I mean, these figures are only as good as the annual reports. And, I ha and this is an important point, um, if I might say so, because I've had lots of quarrels with commissions because they get their, where do they get their request data from? They get it from the line departments. Where do the line departments get it from? They get it from their field offices. Some of them have online systems, others don't. This is just, so you know, is it garbage in, garbage out? Maybe not, but the overall trend is probably accurate, but you could really quarrel with the numbers if you were to, to dig. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't have time series data to do that, uh, but the impression is that it's, it's, it's ballooning. Yeah, it's ballooning, ballooning, yeah, ballooning. 
and to the point where you know we're getting delays of I mean I'll get into the demon case soon but uh, it took a year and a half it, it demon happened in 2006 RTI request filed by Venkatesh Naik 10 days later he doesn't get the information until 2019 three years two years to get a hearing on demon so I mean the commissions need to fast track some cases that are of public interest you know uh, uh, with you know Venkat had to wait a long time now does th now you know the other challenge facing RTI and I think it's less of a challenge than we actually think is this whole privacy question but the RTI privacy activists RTI activists and privacy activists are at each, each other's throats but I think there's no contradiction because uh, you know basically we want the state to have less access to our information as individuals and we want to have more access to what the state holds so these are two sides of the same coin in my opinion right so uh, you know the state has been exceptionally intrusive with Aadhaar and, and other kinds of, of data exceptionally intrusive and demanding of, uh, of, of extracting data for governance um, so this, this clearly needs some regulation the Supreme Court you, there is an exemption for privacy in the RTI Act unwarranted invasion and the Supreme Court has in fact been pretty tough they've said that disclosure of personal financial information in the case of an ordinary citizen to a third part to, to, to another individual is not allowed whether it's in assets assets liabilities or a, you know whatever a tax return you you know uh, you can't uh, uh, ask someone else to furnish that under RTI so that's pretty strict also examiners and um, you know interviewers you know they've said well names of interviewers will not be disclosed names of examiners will not be disclosed because you know uh, of course this doesn't happen to Jindal but you know, you know if I fail someone maybe the student will come after me and you know do something bad to me uh, so this was the logic and this came out of a case in Bihar where uh, you know <laughs> they wanted to know why you know uh, uh, people people from the you know, state either the, the public service commission wanted to sort of just basically uh, uh, you know uh, find out why they hadn't got, got the job and they wanted the names of the interviewers and the examiners and the court said no you can have the sheets but you can't have the names because they worried that these guys would get bumped off or whatever or some bad thing would happen to them so now this new data protection or Sri Krishna report is a fabulous report you should all read that uh, I went through it uh, how many of you know about the Sri Krishna report great fabulous it's a great report I mean he's done a terrific job he and uh, he, uh, Sri Krishna and his team basically you know this is standard stuff right to correct information right to access it uh, right to be forgotten uh, accountability of data fiduciaries to data principles that is us um, you know uh, sharing of information to third parties we need this badly I don't think it conflicts in any way with, with RTI uh, the only way w place where you may have some question is the scope of personal information um, so you know uh, sensitive personal information would include things like passwords uh, it would include things like uh, financial information it would include things like medical information health information uh, you know it might include your employment history uh, so there, there's certain things that you know where this exemption might be a little bit widened but it's well worth paying the price for a, 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 a proper privacy framework I don't think it's a problem the real problem in my view is state surveillance to me this is the real elephant in the room I don't care about this other stuff I think it's fine the state surveillance is the problem now I'm going to China uh, on the 28th um, actually I'm going on holiday so I'm heading off to Xi'an and uh, stuff but they have this you all know about the facial recognition technology that they're using right you know they have this massive database of citizens with photos etc etc and uh, you know if uh, you know I you know they, I'll enter the airport they'll take my picture they'll have my fingerprints and it'll go into their database I'm walking on Xi'an um, you know suddenly I, I I fancy you know I do something wrong they can immediately pick up my 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 my, my photo match it and send someone to the spot there and it's happening there's a Chinese criminal who had been on um, you know uh, uh, on the run for a while and he, he but he had a fancy for the opera so he turned out turned up at the opera um, and uh, was picked up at this you know his face was scanned while he was entering the 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 hall by the security cameras and as he was leaving the opera 
police were there to arrest him. So think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is mass mass scanning. Now I have no problem uh, up to a point, you know, because it's uncomfortable. But there is an issue here, you know, with our Aadhaar card system. You have the technology to do this, and we don't know. It's already happening, and we don't know wh how where this technology is going to go. And you know, the MHA. What? Yeah. So one of the projects which is Yeah. That's where I live. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a posh guy, but you know, but my so maybe my father was a posh guy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so yeah. All the crime or anything which is happening in Kashmir, they are plotting it with the slums right next to that. That's right. Yeah, the idea is that this is where it's coming, and the idea is to predict. That's right. The investigation is going now. Is that to predict? Yeah, and the police love this stuff. They, 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 they love it. But the thing is, we also have to put real limitations, and this is what privacy does. It says, oh, all right, now our surveillance rules are quite loose, uh, because uh, in practice it's very easy to get a surveillance order or an interception order. But these laws, what they do is they say your, your surveillance is limited for a period of time for a specific purpose. And, the, and, and it, is, uh, 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 it is actually uh, uh, monitored by the judiciary and parliament. But will our parliament actually monitor? It's not clear. But you know, the privacy law will put some limits on surveillance. But with this sort of technological uh, you know, sort of barrage of new technologies, this is going to be a major challenge. And that's what I'm afraid of. And uh, yeah. Yeah, argument of the government is that if Facebook and Google can have this information, why can't Yeah, two wrongs don't make a right. I would say regulate Facebook and Google, effectively. I mean, that's, that's my response to that. Uh, government, of course, will make all sorts of arguments. And now with you know, the horrible things happening, you know, the look at Sri Lanka, the, the hand of the security apparatus it, it has been strengthened. And I, I'm not opposed to that. We do need some monitoring, but you know, with some checks and balances. You know, because, uh, but anyway, so overall, I think privacy is not a huge threat. I think it, in fact, complements the RTI, although there will be some some tensions uh, over, over the definition of personal information. That's my take on that. Now, just to wrap up, um, and feel free again to interrupt. Basically, RTI can work well only if the overall accountability environment is favorable. It can't work well as a standalone initiative. Somebody has to listen to your query. Now, one of the disturbing things, as you, know, as you see, if you, if you look at accountability institutions, I mean, this 30 million, 30, now it's 35 million pending judicial cases. This is like, how on earth can you live in a country? It's amazing that we don't, we're not all jumping on top of each other and killing each other when you have a judicial system that has 30 million cases pending. Court cases take 10, justice takes 10, 15, 20 years to deliver. I mean, you can't have this. And uh, to me, that's the uh, most serious accountability problem that we have. It is with the judiciary. It's not with the Modi government. It is, it is squarely with the judiciary. Um, now, this Lokpal business, I was never a great fan of the Lokpal Act. I think it was just too bureaucratic and cumbersome and uh, you know, um, could interfere with decision-making processes. Nonetheless, they, they, they didn't bother to operationalize it. Right to public service legislation has been scattered. Um, now, in this environment, if RTI commissions fail to perform to expectations, they become part of the larger problem, not the solution. And that is, 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 is a big issue. Now, where do we go from here? Basically, uh, civil society and media engagement has been very positive on the RTI. That, I think, will continue. I think the courts have come up with some great rulings. Now, the latest ruling, um, how many of you are, are aware of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the recent ruling by the Supreme Court on demonetization on, on the RBI? It's a fascinating ruling, Sudarshan. Well, basically, there's this guy. He went to the Supreme Court. I, I mean, he, uh, he went to uh, the RBI, this appellant, uh, and he said, look, I want data on um, foreign deri deri derivatives contracts. And there were losses, uh, huge losses. Uh, attached to that by the banks. And RBI denied this information. He went 
to the to the court to the CIC. They said release it, and it went up. up it eventually, ended up in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said you have to release this information. This is back in 2015. RBI not only did not release the information after the Supreme Court order, they came up with a new information disclosure policy that not only banned release of foreign currency derivatives data, uh, uh, foreign, uh, but but also all other all other sorts of categories, other sorts of categories of information. And so this fellow took, took the RBI to court in contempt. And uh, RBI said, you, I hold you in contempt. Yes. And uh, please, uh, they said, all right. The RBI said, all right, we'll release the information on, on the derivatives contract. But in addition, we're going to release, because the petitioner had filed in the meantime another sort of request, uh, all the information relating to inspection reports <coughs> of public sector banks and private sector banks, ICICI, HDFC, State Bank, uh, Sahara, uh, because the RBI has to conduct these inspection reports. So they had to take down their disclosure policy, release all these inspection reports. I think it's a big deal. Now, um, the other thing is uh, Venkat Nayak, Venkatesh, finally got the minutes of the meeting on the D. Have you seen those? I mean, how many of you have seen these minutes on, on D? Uh, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's uh, it's abs if you give me just a minute, and, and then I'll wrap up. It's just very interesting. One thing is interesting, they, they seem to invoke the World Bank, uh, where they say the white paper also quotes the estimate made by the World Bank in July 2010, wherein the size of the shadow economy for India has been estimated 20.7%. I don't know if we ever did this um, estimate or where we got our data from. Yeah, and they've pinned that on us. Yeah. I went through that paper before it was released. Yeah. So there were three estimates made, and they varied between about, if I recall, something like 16% to 32%. Yeah. There were three estimates. This was just uh, prior to, oh, but this was in 2012. Yeah, but they picked up this, this uh, ostensible World Bank data. But when you read it, it shows how reluctant they are, actually. You know, arriving, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, the, uh, uh, the currency went up by 90% over a certain period of time. GDP grew by uh, much less. The GDP growth rate was real, whereas the currency growth rate was nominal. Uh, you know, so they, 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 in a way, undermine the rationale uh, for demonetization. Um, but I'll give it to you. Yeah, so it, yeah. Here it is, the minutes. And, and, uh, I'll, I'll give this to you. When I leave, I have a copy of it, no problem. The board considered the memorandum and after detailed deliberations <laughs> decided in the larger public interest, the balance of advantage, balance of advantage would uh, lie in withdrawal of all legal tender. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a stunning document. It took Venkat two years to get this, five hearings. RBI didn't turn up for some of the hearings. And finally, they said, all right, here are the minutes. And, um, you know, uh, what can I say? Uh, so basically, uh, the commissions and the courts have done a great job, in my, my opinion. I mean, I, I, I hats off to them on this. Um, the attacks on RTI activists, very sad. You know, 311 um, incidents over 15 years, and about 56 deaths, 51 murders, and about five suicides. And so CHRI has set up this house of shame, and it's going to be a, a kind of internet space where they track this using Google alerts and uh, mining the English language uh, newspapers. Uh, the vernacular, they need to mine that also because you'll find that the number of assaults, threats, all of that goes up. And it's not just a matter of the numbers, it's also the salience of the case. You know, uh, a lot of this will involve the property mafia and this mafia and the sand mafia and, you know, the, all these mafias. And it is, it is risky to take these characters on. Now, the possibilities of technology also mean that, uh, that we can disclose information more proactively. I think that, that's where we have to go with RTI. But processing it, possessing information is not enough. You have to be able to actually enforce accountability and change governance. And, you know, I'd like to end with this because when we looked at the earlier slide where we, we analyzed the applications, I'd like to repeat that study now and see where we are. 
because if in fact a new study shows the same patterns we haven't learnt anything because what it means is that RTI is a palliative I want to sort out my problem I want to get this bit of information I want to put pressure to, to extract something from the system I file an RTI request it works has the system changed oh so uh, you know Modi in fact um, and I think he's correct here you know at the beginning of his term he said look you know with, with RTI government officials need to analyze these RTI he's got a good governance mind uh, they have to analyze these requests and they have to figure out what the problems are the you know, problems that leap out from these requests and then fix the systems so let me end with that I mean to me RTI is just a symptom and as we analyze that we, we figure out you know yeah what ails the the system and we fix those systems okay yeah thanks yeah Right, exactly. Where's the governance result? So this is the question I'm asking. Yeah, that's right. So that's something we said, but still, I mean, how do we solve the problem? Let's talk, please. Darcy, please. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't know about the talk. I think sometimes we get swamped with email that you know, maybe we miss something. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, but I think, you know, I'll compliment, I think, what he said rather than you challenge. Um, one, I think, uh, with the interesting thing. Um, that is um, happening uh, is with regarding to uh, if uh, the government uh, agency they are maliciously misinterpreting the third party exemption. That's true, that's a good point, yeah. And uh, so, previously, while one went to the Ministry of Home Affairs website, they just put up, they did not do any uh, additional synthesizer you know, of the make of the RTI applications, they just put any application they received, application, and the response by the Home Ministry was made available on the website. Now, uh, when you, if you go to the website, you need to have like criteria of that. Mm. So the name of the applicant, last name or file number or you know RTI registration or subject. Only then you can click and you'll get that. Uh, if, uh, so and that is, I think that part you know where about uh, about duplication. Um, uh, I think this habit has you know become ingrained that uh, if anything contains a personal name, let's apply third party. Oh, really? Because so, if I, uh, so what they are saying is, people have made an RTI application through a ministry. <coughs> uh, if you ask, can you tell me uh, which are the applications you received? Okay, uh, email response candidates that contains third party information, denied. So, Home Ministry for several years did do, uh, where they just said, okay, this year we received this many, they just put the copies there. 
So I had at that time I kind of downloaded and kept you know a lot of those applications uh, to you know look, but you know where the applicants' information was there. Yeah. So applicants' information was regarding you know, the um, But now this third party exemption has you know been really uh, uh, I think misappropriated. Uh, part of it I think is you know you know uh, since it's almost 10, 15 years now, right? Yeah. But, 15. Uh, which is the public information often serves actually have no claim. Nowhere, you know, uh, uh, whenever I make any application, I ask them, like, did you by chance you know, have a, you know, anything about training or how to handle it and all? Zero. And, like, only in the first couple of years, UNDP, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 provided some uh, resources. Uh, they did a three year project where uh, the, uh, uh, training was supposed to be done. After that, nothing. So, this uh, government has, you know, and there seems to be willingness, you know, say that, but they, they, you know, this lack of training means. That you know, everyone wants to be safe. I don't want to be. So initially, everything everything is becoming a first appeal. Uh, so similarly, my experience is that when I you know I get an automatic, it's almost like a regular any rejection. I speak, I call up, you know, right. the first step. And then when I explain, then they say, oh, okay, you know, they do the you know uh, follow up and then the issue. But I think this first level is, is something that needs to be uh, you know more um, ignorance rather than it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, because that's not their primary job. They are all, you know, section clerk or whatever. Actually, this is an important point. Yeah. The, the PIO is an additional charge. Yeah. And, and that's a very important point. Yeah. It is the person who doesn't, who is not required anywhere else to give it the standard. Yeah, it's, a, it's uh, yeah. So you shouldn't attribute maliciousness when it's simply stupid. Yes. I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where entering to offices has now become a big problem. Oh, it has, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think, and maybe at least central government can be, you know, uh, said uh, that you know they have an online portal where one can easily, you know, sit at the you know, comfort of your desk and something. But uh, they are also doing this physical barrier of even going to an office. Yeah, yeah. So once you say you say my purpose is to do an RTI, then you you know the, your, your, the way your mood or whatever they actually throw obstacles. Uh, before you reach that office. Oh my gosh. They will not disclose you, like, you know, who is the public information officer, where of their office might be. Then each level they will ask you, like, what is your purpose? So from the main gate itself, now I'm finding, you have to use other names and this and that to actually get into Yeah, and you're willing to do that, but yeah. most people will, will, will just get put uh, off and leave. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. is still, you know. Uh, the second thing, uh, I think, you know, which is interesting about the reported cases and, uh, uh, I think this is the green case, which is you know about the uh, effective filing of RTI or of uh, FIRs or not. Is again I think with the consciousness, and you know initially it will data will do that. You know, like, uh, initially scholars uh, doing RTI found that uh, the, the perception of corruption increased uh, after an RTI law was adopted in different countries, and then like, it was actually slightly more reporting of. Uh, so um, uh, the third thing I think I agree with you, which is about utilizing it. And uh, uh, you know the recent work that I've done, you know, which focused um, on how journalists have been using RTI. Mm, uh, that's mm, the project mm. which uh, uh, the university are supporting me to do that. And there, I think there were some interesting uh, 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 findings that I wanted to highlight it because it's an opportunity. Yeah. Great, One please. Is, um, uh, with regard to uh, people in the different you know sectors and uh, levels of government, uh, what they are doing is they are also. If they have information, because even before RTI, people would leak information from the government, right? There would be journalists who would have access and other things, or um, is that what they are hinting at, you know, is, ah, they know there is something, you file an RTI application. Now, this is, you know, uh, uh, means that people should be, uh, uh, one, you know, it would help to have contact. But the other part is also, people should, you know, know where to look for information. And uh, that means we need to understand you know, how is the decision made in a particular, you know, even it could be a small department. Uh, or, you know, for example, if the, say, if you go to a district electorate, each task, you know, ultimately is like signed up by the, you know, the color in the magistrate kind of level. Mm. But, you know, they like, if there is that, you know, section signature, then they will sign automatically. That means, you know, we know where. But I think this understanding, you know, needs to be developed about, you know, government or, you know, governance uh, at different levels. Mm. That mm. means they all have a trajectory. And I think, you know, you would have had experience also being in the government. And that, I think, you know, needs to be also understood. Because who holds information, who generates that first, you know? Uh, because what is happening is a matter like, you know, say demonetization. 
it entails a lot of different ministries and bodies in the government. But somewhere someone initiates a fight. Now, it would be ideal if you know that, because you can ask them and they will you know, uh, you get whatever. Because once it crosses them and goes on to the next one will say, it did not originate from me. I did not see it. I need to seek their permission to disclose. And I think that is something uh, we need to understand about, you know, the decision making processes also mm. to make effective RPI. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, uh, with regard to uh, even in the judiciary, uh, in, the, in the journalism law, and when I interview, a lot of people actually, um, uh, you know, don't pay good attention to information available that the government even, you know, makes it proactively available. Mm. Uh, uh, we interviewed over uh, 50 odd journal or journalists. We targeted the top 20 newspapers by circulation in India. So not just English, you know, and Hindi, but across, mm. you know, uh, Telugu, Sri Telugu, Sri Tamil, Tu Malayalam, and you know, Tu Marathi, and whatnot. When we asked him, like, do you look for information available in the, you know, uh, any website? The, you know, three fourths of the uh, respondents said no, we don't look. So <coughs> there is some information. Mm. Not that there is not. But even what you say, you know, uh, is not being used. So if you gather that, win the case to ask a better question. Mm. Because if you just ask, you know, data about this, you know, because RTI is, you know, clearly states, government has no obligation to create information for you. If it has, it has to disclose. And many times these, you know, officials say, we don't have, have the information that you ask for. They will have it in other shapes or forms where, you know, money uh, where But they have no obligation like this, you know, how many requests have you got, uh, you know. Uh, if you, they don't have an obligation to create that report and whatnot. Right. But if you know for a fact that X department creates an annual report in which such information might be there, your RTI should be that specific. Saying that, can you please share that, you know, and say Very generous. they will be in a bind to disclose. Because if they say no, it's a no. They say it's a, a, a wrong on their part, and you know, it's an unravel. So this, I, I think, again, we need to, I think, for RTI, it's, it's a great job in law, but yeah. we need to really understand how government... I agree, happens. I agree. I think, I think yeah. these are all great points. Uh, so, uh, I think yeah. that, that I think we are need, you know, more... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, uh, of the, those effective, uh, you know, those, you know, either journalists or civil society activists and all. So, it's not just me. We training for civil society activists. Activists, journalists, uh, you know, to, to become smarter about it, about the questions they ask. No, no, I, I think that this is all, all, all great points. I mean, I, our PIOs are under-trained, poor morale, and uh, a very little authority. Very bad, very bad, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I, 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 it's very sad. It's, it's very sad. And this third party issue that you raised, uh, I think that's, uh, that's also true that they've been very lenient uh, in disallowing requests uh, using the third party exemption. One thing on the third party is, uh, you know, uh, government, uh, that when government possesses information about companies um, uh, given to it in confidence, there is a, there's a section 2F, I think it's section 2F, that allows you to seek third party information from government uh, directly. And uh, that has lots of implications for the environment, uh, for industrial regulation, uh, uh, and other kinds of things, uh, which, uh, which, which I think uh, is something worth probing. I, I, but we basically agree entirely with what you've said. Um, absolutely right, and uh, no, no question about that. Races through a presentation, but then you have to discipline more. We interrupted you. And no, no, I'm very, very happy that, that you did. Yeah. So I think I can formally close the uh, lecture part and we have some proper dialogue and teach. Uh, unless you have to have a talk. Swagato, great seeing you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, 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 I'll be going up to Sudarshan's office, just get my stuff, and I'll pop across. Okay. Sunita is learning to be a good bureaucrat. <laughs> Whenever anyone wants an appointment with me, she says, "What's the purpose of the agenda?" <laughs> <laughs> Sunita, if you if you do a transcript of this, don't put it on the web, <laughs> uh, please, because uh, if you do want a redacted version of what we discussed, that that can be done. Uh, we can do a summary and all that, but otherwise, be careful what you what you actually uh, publicize, because. Yeah, <laughs> third parties that I mentioned, I'll be getting phone calls. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah.